Korean. And so, like, for example, um, the introduction, um, we have to provide the acad academic context, the current state of research, and enable the reader to see how the entire essay is going to be um, focused and maintained. And also, we have to make explicit references to the research question throughout the essay. That's a very good point, um, yes. Yeah, that's something, it's easy to lose the focus, especially in a really long essay. Yeah. Um, and then, um, oh yeah, and then also we have to, students should evaluate the evidence at the point where they introduce it rather than like separately and uh -huh. Um, and yeah, we, we should draw conclusions throughout the essay rather than like kind of, cause like sometimes in LAQs, I feel like it's just, we kind of separate the evaluation and, the, um, and we do all the, the concluding at the end, mm -hmm. but then I feel like, yeah, it's important to draw distinctions between that and, um, yeah, so that's kind of like the things I had right. to remind so myself. The, of. Yeah. So from the evaluation, so with the LAQs as well, when you do your evaluation, what I'm trying to push a lot of you to do is connect the evaluation to the topic and to the question, okay? Uh, and that is where it will bring you to your higher grades uh, with regards to the critical thinking criterion and also knowledge and understanding. So like in LAQ for extended essay as well, when you are analyzing, you need to, again, tie it back to the question. It's always in reference to the question because you're using your res uh, research that you find to apply it and answer a question, okay? If you start digressing and if you start moving away from the question and start focusing on other things, then you lose points for focus, okay? So it's very important to always, each research that you do and all of your evaluations, you will have to look at it in terms of that research, but also the bigger picture of the question that you have at hand. Okay, so anything that you wanna add, Joanne? Uh, no. Okay, so let's go to Kevin. He has said something here. What I understand is it gave us a lot of criteria <laughs> and how to decide topic and the specific reference that we mentioned and how to do well in each section. Yes, so the guide does give you an idea of the criteria, which I will go over a little more, and also how you can choose topics. I think there's a little um, section on how to choose good questions as well. Okay, so Aiko, would you mind going first? Let's, we'll wait on. Okay. Okay, so um, I learned that it is um, must be based on secondary sources only. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like if it's prim primary um, data, it's it's going to be our IA, mm -hmm. and um, we should be ensure that like the the topic that we choose is like focused, mm -hmm. but like um, not too broad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, must be sure that there's like enough relevant and appropriate resources are available. And um, we shouldn't do a topic like pop psychology or yes, yeah, self help. <laughs> like yeah. must be supported by peer review. Yes. So yeah. you brought up some really good points. We have the internal assessment. And we also have the extended essay. So what makes the distinction between the two is that your internal assessment is you actually conducting the research on a population in school. Okay, so that is primary research. Mm -hmm. For extended essay, you will not be conducting any surveys. You will not be conducting any experiments on your own. Your whole question will be answered based on research that has already been conducted by peer reviewed uh, articles, okay? And the point about pop psychology, that is very important because there are a lot of blogs uh, online that focus on trying to explain behavior, but these are not good resources for you to use uh, academically, okay? I'm not saying that these blogs are not fun to read, but for academic purposes, avoid using any blogs in your references because it can be pop psychology, okay? So um, again, if it's a blog that has made reference to um, 
research article, then that's okay for you to start like your preliminary reading or your first reading so that you have a good understanding of the topic. Okay, so Sin, are you ready to go? Oh, hello, Misty. Hi, yeah. Okay. Uh, for, for the EE, um, so about analysis part, um, like it should be like balanced between argument, argument and the response to the research question. And, um, and, Did your work get cut off? Okay, so you talked about evaluation and how that needs to connect to the question. Again, a relevant point. So I'm going to go over, I thought I would go over the whole EE, but that would be a lot of information. So I'm gonna go over the first few sections or the first few steps that we need to take into you meeting your 20th May deadline, which is to have a working um, research question. Okay, so that is the first step, coming up with your research question. Um, before that, I will go over again quite a few of the points that you have already covered. So what is the psychology research um, or EE like? Okay, it is all based on secondary sources. And if you look at it, it is essentially what we refer to as a review of literature. When you go to university and let's say you take psychology or even any other subject, before you conduct any research or even before designing something or before doing a piece of art, or acting in a play you have to do research okay it all requires you to understand what has already been done and take information there and apply it to your current situation so everything requires you to have um, prior knowledge and establish that by looking at what has been already established okay um, so like I said here all research starts with research okay and you can't even regardless of the completely unique or novel idea you have, you need to look at relevant research or similar research in that area before you can actually go ahead and conduct research um, on your own, okay? So very important point, EE is in psychology is all based on secondary sources. You will not be conducting uh, an experiment or survey of your own. Okay, so expectation. So like I said, this is all based on secondary research, with then, which then requires you to formulate a focused research question and also show that you understand the relevance of that question. If you're talking about body image issues, you need to show why is it relevant for you to do research in that area. And especially if you have chosen a specific target population, let's say male adolescents, okay? The relevance of that is there is very little focus of focusing on body image issues for male populations, even though that is something that does exist. And there are pressures on male um, adolescents and male populations to have specific body types, okay? So you need to be able to explain and show that you understand the relevance of your research question. Uh, once you've found what area you want to do your research on and have um, a topic, you need to do your research and find relevant resources. Sorry about that, okay. So what I was saying is that you need to find relevant resources and research. Um, if you're talking about body image issues and you're going to focus on body image issues that are not clinical in nature, you need to make sure that your resources are not focused on eating disorders, okay? So it has to be relevant to the topic you've chosen. And if it is something like similar to that topic, it needs to be clear that you understand that this is not the same as your, um, your variable, okay? And these resources, again, have to be peer-reviewed articles. They're not just blog posts and not just stuff that you've come across online. Uh, it has to be proper um, research, okay? Once you have found all of your researches and you've made your notes, you need to develop a reasoned argument, okay? That means that it needs to answer the question, but not only one side of the question, okay? A good EE, if it is one-sided, that is not a good EE. So a good EE means that you have considered different arguments or different stances of an argument, okay? Um, 
And again, this argument needs to be based on relevant sources of what you have found online in terms of um, journal articles, okay? And you need to be able to use your knowledge of psychology well. You need to be able to understand that topic well. Um, this is why a lot of the times it is um, recommended to not choose topics that are too genetic in nature because those are usually difficult to explain. And expecting students of a high school level to understand genetics is difficult, okay, and it's a challenge. So choosing a topic that you think you can do justice to and that you will be able to understand in depth without really, you know, just about understanding the surface level. So you need to choose a topic that you can understand and can show that you understand. And again, using psychological terminology is very important, not only in relation to that topic, but also research methodology, which you already do in class for your LAQs and for all of your assignments, okay? Um, it also requires you to cite your resources. Okay, you've done your annotated bibliography and you've, again, when you're writing your LAQs, you're always, and SAQs, you're always telling which researcher. If it was McGuire at Al, you mentioned that. So citing the sources is very important um, because that makes sure that you are giving the credit where it is due and not claiming that idea to be your own. Okay, uh, and if you don't cite it, that is considered academic misconduct and the IB has zero tolerance towards that um, and they will probably flag your EE or any other uh, assignment that you submit to them and that also could mean that you don't get your diploma. So it is very important to cite your resources and also follow a standard academic um, manner. So I think most of school is um, following MLA but I still think APA will be more beneficial for you because when you go on to study psychology in university, most universities follow APA, which is the American Psychological Association's um, guidelines for formatting and structuring, okay? Demonstrating critical thinking. This has to be both at a micro level and macro level. You're not only evaluating just the research, you are also evaluating the research in relevance to your topic and your topic in relevance to, you know, greater, to, uh, greater issues, for example, um, there's something called digital divide, which is some people in our society don't have access to internet or phones. And in a country like India, that is quite possible because a lot of people live under poverty line and they don't have access to information the same way I do. Okay, so if I am conducting research on um, the effect of media or social media and technology on a certain topic, am I considering or am I being able to evaluate that this research is all based on people who do have access to technology. And obviously that then means that it cannot be compared to people who don't have access and cannot be generalized to those who cannot be um, able to access technology. So again, you have to connect to greater issues such as di digital divide and there are other um, issues with regards to research that also you need to be able to connect to. And finally, the reflection process. There's three major reflections, and these do count for um, grades in the EE, which is of six points. Uh, and this is all about how you are making decisions of your topic, how you're choosing your resources, and what are your learning processes, okay? So you have to be able to reflect on this process at three different points, which is before you um, write, start writing your essay, which is once you've chosen your topic, um, somewhere in the interim, which is while you're doing it, what are the challenges you're facing? How are you overcoming that? What are the decisions you're making? And after the Viva, which is a meeting or um, discussion that the two of us will have, after you've finished your EE, you will do your final reflection, okay? So in terms of grades and criteria, I think all of you have already been um, exposed to that in the guide, you've read through it. Um, there's five criteria in total. And it is kind of like a launch off from the LAQ. It's not something that you're completely alien to, okay? It's just slightly different. So if you look at focus and method, in your LAQ focus is two points, which means that are you staying on topic, okay? And are you communicating your topic accurately and effectively? Effectively being, are you still on topic throughout the essay or is it only just in the beginning and then you start talking about completely unrelated things? Okay, so your ability to maintain focus throughout the essay 
and try answering the question is what will be uh, part of the, um, what the examiner will grade for this criterion. And again, like a lot of you have said that you need to constantly refer back to that question and make your um, kind of like sub conclusions throughout the essay to ensure that the uh, examiner can see that you are being focused, okay? So then the research question has to be clearly stated and focused, and we will go over how you can do that, okay? And methodology is complete. So methodology here is your choice of um, resources, okay? Uh, are you doing a comparison? You just have to describe in your introduction that you will be comparing or you will be arguing for this um, topic, okay? Let's say we're looking at media and self-esteem like Joanne is, okay? Social media and self-esteem. If there are researches that you are using in support of it, then you will um, mention that these are the resources that you are going to use to support this idea and then other articles that kind of contradict that idea, okay? So that is your method. It's just outlining your um, how you're going to do this essay. So knowledge and understanding, again, like your LAQ, it's going to be for six points. Uh, it is about your knowledge and understanding of that topic, of research, and also psychology in general, um, and also the use of relevant um, sources to answer your question. So this is something that is going to affect your focus, your knowledge and understanding, and your critical thinking. So the application and the use of the uh, resources that you have chosen. Okay, so it's very important for you to choose articles that are relevant and that you can apply to your question. Okay, um, and the final thing is effective use of terminology, very important, both in terms of research and um, terminology relevant to that topic. Critical thinking times two, that's 12 whole points for critical thinking. And this is where most students suffer because their critical thinking is of, often very obvious points of critical thinking. They talk about gender, but when they evaluate it, they don't connect it to the bigger, broader argument, okay? So if you just evaluate your research, you're probably going to get a three, maybe a six, if it's really good, um, what do you say, evaluation of the research. But if you don't go beyond that, that's where it will stop, okay? So again, you have to make sure that you, um, make connections to broader arguments. And broader arguments can mean what are the different methods that you are seeing in all of the um, researches that you have chosen, okay? Some of the times, there's a lot of commonalities. If you looked at the cognitive approach, most of the researches were um, lab experiments. So what is the bigger problem of having research that is only lab experiments, okay? So that's one point of discussion, which is a broader discussion. And now, how does that issue, or how, maybe it's a strength as well, how does that relate to your broader um, topic, okay? Does it limit your understanding of it? Is there ecological validity? So are we able to really understand it in real life based on lab experiments? So critical thinking, we need to make sure that it's there in almost every other uh, paragraph, every other research that you use, so that you are able to show consistent uh, evaluation and questioning of what you are using. Okay, so 12 points, that's, that's the toughest criteria um, for this EE. Then there's the presentation, which is four points. And again, this should be something that you shouldn't lose points in because uh, I think it's the easiest part of it, which is making sure that your structure of the essay is good. And again, in your LAQ, you um, get two points for organization. I can relate this to that. So structuring of the essay. Are you leaving all of the evaluation right at the end? Or is your argument not well paced or well flowing, okay? So if you're talking about a certain thing and then you refer back to another thing but never get back to what you're talking about initially, that shows bad flow and also structure that is not good enough. So structure and formatting, again, formatting is going to be in reference to your APA, okay? Uh, it has to be consistent font style, font size, line spacing, all of those very basic things that if you keep in mind and make sure you can get these four points quite easily, okay? And engagement. This is um, the examiner's evaluation of whether you have truly 
embrace the process of research, okay? And the only way that they can understand that apart from reading your essay is um, through your reflections. So this six points is all for your reflection. Uh, and that is why I want you to sh um, make sure that you don't ignore your reflections and also are very mindful of, of the things that you learn during this process because that is what they want to see. How are you making decisions? How are you getting over issues that you come across? Okay, and the total points is going to be 32 marks. It is very important for you to choose a topic that you truly enjoy um, researching that you're interested in and also a topic that you think can be of benefit to you going on to university. So it's not going to be only for the purpose of the grades, but also a greater purpose in terms of this is going to help me in my study in university. Uh, it's going to have some value in my life and it's going to show me or teach me skills um, beyond a grade. Okay, so do you have any questions about the criteria and what the expectations of the EE are so far? No. Um, I have, okay. I have one question. Well, Could you go to the previous slide again? Yeah, here. Oh yeah, so, um, oh yeah, yeah, I remember. So, um, like I saw in some samples for their introduction, they actually state all the researches that they're going to be using. Yeah. yeah. So is that something we should or we shouldn't do? You should, you should. Uh, I will ask Sylvia and also Christine, now Christine, to share their EEs and they have done that, okay? So along with, that is basically your methodology, okay? You stating all of the researches that you're going to use and kind of giving a summary and a thesis, okay? Um, saying that this is my stance of this topic right at the beginning of your uh, introduction, like in your introduction, it is very important. And that is methodology that they're referring to. So you need to do oh. for sure, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to move on then. So the first, uh, first step is finding research. And I think some of you have already started doing that. Um, because it is all based on secondary research, you need to make sure that the topic and questions you choose are research uh, are based on research that is available if you choose a topic or a question that is completely new and that there isn't enough research to support the answer, then it'll be difficult for you to um work on your ee okay so, yeah so the first step is for you to find good relevant research that has been conducted in that topic Okay, and what are those psychologists saying about your topic? Um, and are there any differences in the findings? That is, again, a very important point. If you find research that is all one-sided and all of the researchers are saying the same thing, that already shows that your argument throughout your EE is going to be limited, okay? So you need to make sure that you find researchers that have varying findings and also varying discussions in their um, research. So before going into formulating your actual question, your first step is for me, and most people would agree with this, is to find five researches at least, okay? Um, three in support of your topic, okay? Or your preliminary question, uh, and two against that, okay? So if I'm looking at, um, I think, if you look at, Christine's uh, research last year, which was on to what extent do, um, does social media affect the experience of anxiety in adolescents, okay? That is a pretty re uh, specific research topic. So now, are there researches that say that excessive use or to using technology or using social media too much uh, does cause um, or does correlate with anxiety, okay? And are there researchers that are saying that actually no, um, using social media does not necessarily have that kind of impact, okay? And she did find one research that said to restricting or um, making sure that you don't use social media at all can in fact cause anxiety. So you are making the difference between excessive usage and restricted usage. So there is a counter argument provided, okay? So what I'm going to do now is ask you to go over these arguments, okay? 
And I just want you to think for two minutes and we will come up with counter arguments. So counter arguments, again, is something that goes against what is being stated. So these are all topics that we have kind of covered in class. So I just want you to look at all three of them and think of possible counter arguments that you can make to these claims. Okay, just take two minutes. Okay, so the first one, flashbulb memories are reliable. We've learned flashbulb memories and we know that they're highly vivid and they're emotional and they're based on personal relevance. So are there any counter arguments that you can make to flashbulb memories being reliable? Um, maybe like the, well, some researchers argue that it's, it's not reliable because um, of like a spe special neural mechanism, but because of frequent rehearsal, mm -hmm. so that could be a counter argument. So um, because it's so personally um, significant mm -hmm. and has a strong emotional impact, the individual is more likely to um, rehearse it. And then in the process of rehearsal, it's possible that they, the memory is distorted or reconstructed. Right, so that's a very good counter argument. Kevin has one. Uh, for example, the case on court that we discussed um, before in class, that is not reliable because it has a lack of evidence. Right, so where I think it was um, the lady who thought, I mean, she was raped, I think, and then she found, um, the person and wrongly accused the person and said, I remember for sure that this was the person. Uh, and here again, it's high personal relevance and there was a lot of emotion and there was trauma involved, but yet she was not able to find the real person because again, um, there is a threshold of emotions, right? If there's too much emotion in, to an extent that it is traumatic, it can actually affect how reliable um, a memory is. Okay, so again, there can be counter arguments for this. And also we've looked at some uh, research that talk about culture and flashbulb memories. Um, for example, collectivistic cultures are seen to have less flashbulb memories or flashbulb memories that are slightly different because their focus is not on individual experiences, but on experiences of the group. Okay, so aggressive behavior is a result of genetic predispositions. How can you provide counter arguments for that? This is a pretty simple statement here genetic predispositions well there could be social cultural factors and um, economic right. factors or if the person experienced abuse then that's not a genetic predisposition but um it's the for example if their parents or their other people abuse them then they may be more likely to show aggressive behavior than those who are in like a safe environment so Right. I and mean, there's a lot of environmental factors mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also the evidence for like the, I think it was the MAOE gene, it's mm -hmm. limited and not all studies showed a strong like relationship between the gene and aggressive behavior. Right. So all genetic predisposition and its manifestation, uh, manifestation into behavior is all correlational in nature. Right. So which means that there are several other third variables that cause that uh, or contribute rather not cause, but contribute to that aggressive behavior. It's not a necessary factor. Right. Uh, it just having a predisposition. Again, that's another argument. Not just having a predisposition is not enough for aggressive behavior to manifest. And like you said, there can be your own exposure to aggressive behavior on first hand being let's say abused as a child or um, being bullied so that can also be another variable and you can also learn aggressive behavior right Aiko how do you think one can learn aggressive behavior mm, for example at school and like your environment is um, all like do you think you can learn aggressive behavior from movies and oh movies? yeah right oh yes yeah. Yeah, so with digital technology and, you know, technology in general and being exposed to different types of medias, it increases an individual's susceptibility to learn aggressive behavior if they're being exposed, okay? And also with that argument, we can argue that mere exposure is not enough to develop aggressive behavior because people are more complex than that they have individual choices, okay? You can choose to be aggressive and, you, I mean, you can choose to control your aggression as well because we have that, abil uh, that ability 
as human beings who have more developed brains and cognitions. Okay, so there are again a lot of um, counter arguments that you can make with regards to um, the statement. Finally, love and attraction are manifestations of biochemical processes. So we have learned this in the biological approach. There are a lot of biochemical processes that are involved, like neurotransmitters and uh, hormones, and also pheromones. So what could be the counter arguments to love and attraction being only biological? Um, well, in, it's well. There's evidence for it being manifestations of bi chemical processes in animals, but that's not necessarily transferable to humans. And especially, like, yeah, I I remember so um, in like these days, there's a lot of online dating, and there's a lot of um, like love and relationships that are happening over online and over devices, and that doesn't allow the biochemical processes to have an effect and yet there people are still able to form attraction and um relationships so that's kind of a counter argument right yeah and we will be learning human relationships next year in db2 and in that they talk about proximity proximity is how close you are in terms of physical nature um do you are you my neighbor or do you go to the same school okay and initially a lot of theorists said that being uh, in close proximity to a person increases the likelihood of you being attracted to them. But again, like Joanne mentioned, we have digital devices that allow us to connect to people across the globe. And there are dating websites that allow us to connect to people that could be potentially um, someone we want to date. So these variables or these theories that we have come across so far are not based, I mean, at least are limited in approach considering the current situation and globalization and connectivity that digital technology provides, okay? So again, there are so many different counter arguments that you can make and your EE needs to be rich in counter arguments. So you need to approach an argument from different directions, okay? Okay, so like I was mentioning, it's very important for you to find researches that are um, of both support and also contradicting or opposing or giving new perspectives to the topic that you have chosen. And when you're choosing your articles, the five that I've said that you need to start off with at least, you can just read the abstract to get an understanding of whether this is relevant to your topic or, or not. And once you've done that, the next step is to start taking notes. And I think I've already mentioned this when we were doing the digital um, technology extension. It is very important for you to take notes on the researches that you read. Um, don't completely rely on just memory and say, oh yeah, I will remember whatever I read in this research paper because that is not going to be the case. Um, we know that memory is not reliable and we know that memory, um, like we are likely to forget. Yeah, taking notes after each of your research or while reading each of your researches is very important. Um, you can either do it in terms of an annotated bibliography, you've already practiced doing that, or in terms of an evidence bank. I would prefer an evidence bank for myself because again, annotated bibliographies, they're already quite lengthy and, um, and wordy, so it is better to jot down in terms of bullet points on an, uh, in an evidence bank. And you can organize that by um, including your notes as aim, procedure, and findings, which you have already been doing for researches in class. Um, you can also include important quotes from the, re, um, from the research that you read. A lot of it might be coming from the introduction and also the discussion. Then um, the citation. It's very important to keep track of the citation because later on you'll be scrambling, trying to find where you found that article and um, who was the researcher. So make sure that you take down the citation um, of, uh, before while you're reading the um, research paper. Oh, I've mentioned that twice. Anyways, so again, evaluation. This is very important. You can um, organize it as evaluation as the researcher has um, done it in their paper. A lot of the times, I mean, all the time when you read a research paper and go into the discussion of the findings, the researcher themselves will evaluate their procedure and their methodology, okay?
okay? So what are, they, what are they saying about their research? And are there any other points of evaluation that you have in mind um, that the researcher might not have uh, included or that might be relevant in relation to your topic and your question, okay? And finally, your ideas and thoughts. Here, this is very important because while reading a paper, you might say, okay, this might be um, a relevant research paper to use as my counter argument. And these are the thoughts that I have about this and what can I write about this? And these are the things that I can connect it to. So writing down your thoughts um, in relation to that research paper is also um, a good idea while taking notes. So an example of how, you, uh, how that might look, this is from In Thinking again. Okay. Okay. So this, again, like I said, is a very good example of how you can take notes um, for your EE because it has the citation, it has the whole summary and your thoughts and evaluation about it. So to begin with, this is the MLA citation. You will again be following APA. Okay. Um, there are very subtle differences in the two, but like I said, it will help you going on forward into university if you're going to study psychology. Um, most universities prefer APA formatting, um, and usually it's a mandatory um, practice to use APA. So putting your citation in your evidence bank is a very good idea because later on you won't be scrambling to find where you found that information or where you found that research. And here again, you can see that the person has also put the link of where they found that um, research so that is a good idea i usually download my pdfs and just have it on my file i think i've gone over this in the past and how i organize it as well so yeah having your resources in place so that you don't have to um, go hunting towards the end is a good idea so the summary again this is something that you already follow which is the aim procedure findings and when i say findings you don't need to focus on the statistics which is the results section of all um, researches because the statistics can make things very complicated and a lot of the times I can't even grasp what they have done. So go straight to the findings or the discussion. Uh, you will understand what their major findings are. And also that part um, of the discussion, usually the researcher talks about their own methodology, okay? And um, what the strengths were and what the weaknesses were. So that will give you a good point um, of evaluation. If there are other points that you would like or you have thought of in terms of evaluation and how that relates to your topic or to your research, then you can add it to your critical thinking, which is under mine. Okay, so there's critical thinking, which is in the text, which is done by the researcher. And then there's critical thinking, which you, uh, you are doing yourself. Okay, both of which are good um, to keep in your evidence bank so that you don't have to think about it all over again later on. And again, quotes you may use. Um, I usually avoid using a lot of quotes, but if there is an important thing like a description or something a participant has said, if it was a qualitative research, uh, I would keep that in this section, okay? So again, I wouldn't use too many quotes, just a, maybe one or two relevant ones in your EE. And again, at the end, there's the thoughts of how you can use this, okay? Um, when you're reading a research, you might get ideas um, of how you can use it. Is it going to be a counter argument? Uh, is it going to help you um, evaluate a different research? So you can just jot down what the purpose of this research and how you can use it in your EE so that you can just insert it or go back to it whenever you want. And when you're going through your evidence bank, you will say, oh yeah, you know, this is what I had thought of then. And again, that thought might change uh, as you progress through that EE, but having that initial thought and initial ideas in place can help you, okay? So any questions about note-taking? No. Yeah, okay. And I have been doing research, I think, for about eight years now, seven years, seven to eight years, um, with regards to like proper research articles and writing papers. I have learned from experience and mistakes of not taking notes and not writing down my citations right at the beginning. Um, it gets really frustrating. So I highly recommend that you take notes right from the start and write down your citations because later on, it's just like you're done with your 4,000 words and you don't have any of your citations done. Um, and then you have to start looking at your whole EE again and saying, oh yeah, okay, this was said by this researcher and then you add your in-text citation and then you look for your references it, it just gets really frustrating so 
make sure that you organize that well right from the start so you don't have to go through that same experience. Um, and stubborn that I was, I was told the same piece of information from my own supervisors and my own teachers, but I did not take that. So again, don't be that person <laughs> and make sure you have your notes in place. Okay. So what I'm going to move on to next is uh, actually formulating a research question. So you all have already read a little on um, research questions from the guide. Okay, and it talks about how it needs to be focused. It has to be related to psychology and um, what are good questions uh, and what are not so good questions. Okay, so that's basically what I'm going to try covering. Uh, it's not too difficult, honestly, um, but it does set the tone for the rest of your EE and it can affect all of the criteria that um, the EE is um, trying to assess. Okay, so the first things first, the question needs to be psychological in nature. Okay, a lot of the times what happens is students will start getting caught up on talking about the history of that behavior or history of, let's say, for example, um, asylums. So asylums were hospitals or institutions back in even as late as, um, I think, the 20th century, right, where, where they put people who were mentally ill and had um, disorders like schizophrenia and they would tie them up and they would electrocute them and there was all sorts of unethical um, practice that happened in asylums. And it is a very interesting topic, but a lot of it is not psychological in nature. Yes, it talks about mental health issues, but it's more institutional. So it would be a more sociological or histor uh, his historical uh, exploration rather than psychological, okay? So we need to make sure that it's psychological in nature, okay? And another example is when you start talking about genetics and biological factors, if you don't focus back on to behavior, it again becomes too biological in nature and might not be a psychology as, as such, okay? And if the examiner feels like your uh, question and your whole EE is not psychological in nature, you are going to suffer with regards to a lot of your criteria, especially focus, um, which you will probably get a two if you're lucky, sometimes even a zero, okay? So we need to make sure that your EE question is psychological and not sociology or history or um, biology, okay? And psychology is a very interrelated and multifaceted area. So it is quite easy for you to digress or move away from psychology to other related areas. So we need to make sure that that focus is maintained so that you don't lose out um, on what this uh, is expecting of you, okay? So then the next question, I mean, the next point is that the question must present a debate, okay? And the debate needs to be something that hasn't been already established. For example, if you are going to look at a nature versus nurture argument, wherein you're saying, okay, genetic predispositions versus, uh, versus environmental factors, that is a very obvious debate. Okay, and it's no longer a debate because it's established now that not one factor or not one area of um, approach, like biological approach, can determine behavior. Behavior is, can be explained from different approaches, from cognitive, from social cultural factors, from biological factors. So if you use a question that does not have a debate, that is a weak question. And again, that sets the tone for the rest of your EE. So it has to be a debate debatable question. And a lot of the times, the best way to do that is to have a to what extent, because that question itself um, is very explicit in saying, yes, I'm going to look at two sides of the argument. One that's going to say it to a, to a large extent, and then the other one saying, yeah, not so much. So then you're able to come to a conclusion based on that. So yeah, debatable question. Um, the question needs to be focused. Uh, and again, I'm going to go over a few examples after this. Um, but if your question is, um, to what extent, again, like I said, to what extent is a very good um, question to use or command term to use. But if your question is, to what extent do biological factors um, influence attraction? I think this is a question that is accepted. But for me, that is not focused enough because it's only 4,000 words that you have you need to focus, let's say, on a specific biological factor if you're going to look at that approach, which could be pheromones, okay? Um, but again, choosing a whole approach 
to your question, it's, it's not focused enough, okay? So it has to be focused. And when I say focused, uh, and let's say we're talking about mental health issues, just saying anxiety is not focused enough because there are different types of anxiety disorders. Um, so you need to make sure that you're saying, okay, obsessive compulsive disorder or generalized anxiety disorder or uh, a specific paranoia or phobia, okay? So it has to be focused. And you can make it focused by looking at a specific population. A lot of the times, um, the choice of population is adolescents because you all are adolescents and it makes relevance uh, for you to, or engagement, it adds to your engagement for you to choose that um, age group. Um, the clear, opera, uh, there needs to be a clear operationalization. Operationalization is again, uh, how you define a variable. And different theorists um, define variables in different ways. So one example that we have come across in the past is violent behavior or aggressive behavior. Um, even though there's so many researchers looking at violence, most theorists have different definitions of violence, okay? So you need to make sure that you are using research that focuses on a specific type of violence and not just violence in general. So is it bullying or is it terrorism? Like I think Kevin wants to focus on terrorism as, uh, and criminal psychology. So what exact violent behavior are you looking at? Or what exact anxiety type are you looking at? Okay, so it has to be specific. It's not just a general loose term, okay? And based on that, your, um, the research that you choose also has to be in line with this operationalization. If you're talking about terrorism, uh, and you choose studies that are on bullying or domestic abuse, that is not the same, okay? So it has to be quite, again, this goes back to your focus and uh, being specific. And the final thing, this is more of an ethical um, standpoint, which is thinking of your audience, okay? Um, making sure that you choose topics that won't offend a certain group, because again, we don't know who your examiner is. We don't know who, um, which background this person comes from. So avoiding topics that can offend a person and that can hurt their sentiments is very important because um, yeah, it's just unethical to do that. It's not nice to be on the receiving end of, let's say someone, um, I think one of the examples that I came across was um, to what extent um, can aggression towards a a female, I think it was like relating to rape, be um, attributed to the idea that they are asking for it, okay? So if your um, examiner is female, she is likely to feel offended and um, it might be a sensitive topic. And again, if it's something that's highly religious in nature and it's in a negative term, again, that's also sociology and not psychology. So please make sure that you choose a topic that does not offend a person, okay? Or a group of people. So yeah, these are the things that you need to keep in mind for um, making your research question. I have a few research questions that I have put together, okay? I want you to evaluate them. So there's five, just take a few minutes to um, look at these questions and think of, is it a good question? And if it's not a good question, what are the problems that this question poses, okay? So I think you can look at one question each so, Aiko, can you look at the question, the first question? Okay. Okay. Um, Sin will do question two. Jason do, will do question three. Joanne will do question four. And Kevin will do question five. Okay. So just take five minutes to look at this question and jot down, is it a good question? And if not, what are the problems that you see in this question? Okay. Okay, so let's start with the first question, Aiko. Yeah. Yeah, so does being a perfectionist have a detrimental effect, so not negative effect on sporting performance? Do you think this is a good question? Okay, so here again, it's the command term. It can sound like a yes or no question but this does allow for exploration of two different sides, okay? So you can see that being a perfectionist can have negative effect on a sports person's performance, but at the same time, there might be researchers that suggest 
that having uh, this perfect perfectionistic uh, tendency can uh, actually improve one's um, sporting performance. So this is not a very obvious question. It can allow for a lot of uh, in-depth arguments and research, okay? So I think in, in my opinion, this is also a very good question. Um, so the second question, which is, is addictive behavior more inherited or is it more influenced by environment? So Sin, I think you had that. Okay, I'm going to read out Sin's uh, response. To investigate in this topic about addiction, it might be quite sensitive, so the research would should avoid asking any sensitive questions that can negatively affect the participants, um, or in this case, the examiner. The topic is not bad, but quite sensitive and must control carried out the participants' anonymity for EE. I think um, we should avoid this type of question. Yes, the sensitivity around addictive behavior, yes, it can be sensitive in nature, but it is something that is often studied and it is important for you to not make any um, generalized statements, right? So that would be a good point. But the bigger focus is that, uh, Kevin, is your question for this, I mean, your response for this or for the one that you were chosen or given? Okay, okay, for yours. So. Another major point here is the fact that it's talking about inheritance and environment. So it's a nature versus nurture question. And again, that is a very obvious answer because we know that both of them have their own influences on addictive behavior, right? So it wouldn't really help you make a great argument. So this question I wouldn't recommend um, for anyone because too obvious an answer for it. Okay, so Jason, are you here? Yes. Yeah, okay, so is there a biological basis for homosexuality? Is this a good question? And if it's not, um, why do you think it's not a good enough question? Um, I don't think it's good enough because um, the question first is close-ended. Um, mm -hmm. So there's not, not much space for discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think, a better question would be like, uh, to what extent um, biological factors would uh, maybe affect, uh, may cause homosexuality or mm -hmm. something like that. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. and also this is a quite sensitive topic because it's yeah. talking about homosexuality mm -hmm. and uh, linking it to biological basis uh, may have a uh, potential ground for or being uh, biased or something, mm -hmm. don't know. Right, so yeah, very good points. First of all, it's a close-ended question. Is there? That says either it is a yes or a no, okay? So that is a very close-ended question and having a question like that just means that um, your argument cannot be necessarily um, very in-depth or broad okay and it results in a yes or no and a lot of the times psychological um phenomenon are never related to a yes or no answer okay it's always to a certain extent or to a large extent so changing that to a what extent question like jason said is a very good idea right so to what extent do biological uh factors influence uh, homosexuality or cause okay i i don't know if we would use cause, but changing the command term already improves the question, right? But for me, this is still a very broad topic, biological basis, okay? Because you can talk about hormones, you can talk about um, genetics, there's so many different factors, so it's still pretty broad. It is acceptable, but to me, still not a good enough um, question because you have only 4,000 words. I'd rather you focus on a specific biological factor um, rather than different biological factors okay so joanne you have to what extent are the media to blame for eating disorders do you think it's a good um, question so i think well first the uh, to what extent the way it's phrased it's yeah it's good because it allows um different perspectives to be explored and um there is definitely debate because um however but 
But then like the IB discourages students from like exploring topics such as eating disorders as they can be quite, yeah, very complex. Mm -hmm. And also um, choosing eating disorders is too broad because there are many different types of eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And so the student would need to focus on maybe one type. Mm -hmm. Um, And then um, maybe like it's possible to focus on one age group or just broadly like teenagers or adults Mm -hmm. um because um they may use like media differently or they may yeah they may have different um differences Mm -hmm. and that also i think the word blame it's a bit negatively it has negative connotations and i think it could be framed in a more neutral wording Mm -hmm. because it's kind of like your the word blame just doesn't yeah have a very yeah, it should be more neutral, I think. And then also media, the media might be a bit broad because mm-hmm. it could include like news, social networking sites, TV, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Right. So very good points. To begin with, um, to what extent already does set a tone for um, discussion, right? So that is a very good command term to use. The Apart from that, this question is a very common question that students choose, the influence of media on eating disorders. And there are several issues with that. First of all, media, right? Media is a very broad term. Um, What kind of media are you talking about? Are you talking about um, social media? Are you talking about Facebook? Are you talking about um, news, right? So again, very broad and blame. Blame means that it is a causal factor. And we don't know, right? The truth is we don't know if media can be blamed and can cause eating disorders. So the, um, and again, eating disorders too general. So it would be too broad a topic. And also um, the answer is kind of um, already given, which is we don't know, right? We don't know if we can blame media specifically for eating disorders, right? Because there's again, a lot of other factors. And the final question um, is, Kevin, I think he sent it on the chat. Let me just look at that. Okay, so the question is a comparison. It's not really stated as a question, but a comparison of the effectiveness of different methods of teaching reading. Okay, so um, yeah, I reckon this question is kind of good, but it has some drawbacks, which is the lack of controversial point because not all the teaching methods can fit everyone. Okay, that's a counter argument. Uh, The audience is wide because this is a global issue, okay? And I reckon the range of this question is short uh, because it only compares about the effectiveness and it is a limit, okay? So those are good points. Uh, We don't know who we're teaching reading to. Is it a second language speaker? Is it a first language speaker? Is it toddlers? Is it older people? Okay, so it's not specific enough in the range or who the target population is and also the comparison. I think we have very little. I'm just going to finish this off and then I'll chat. Okay, so once this ends, we'll go back to the chat. Uh, And the comparison is on different methods. There are so many different methods. So a better way to look at the comparison, if you are choosing a comparative uh, research question, is to choose two specific